So my name is Leah Lovelace and I'm the Director of Folk Art Education uh, here at Vesterheim Norwegian American Museum and Folk Art School. And we have been so excited to be able to offer some digital programs during this time of the pandemic. Um, while our museum is closed at present and our folk art school is, does not have on-site classes, we're trying to do all kinds of things to connect our community and to reach new people out there during this time. So um, just to let you know, tonight's uh, panel, uh, tonight's discussion is a folk art conversation that is really about highlighting um, amazing voices in the folk art community. And you're gonna have a chance to hear one tonight with Karen Keenan, who is gonna be talking about Swedish hair work. Um, just to remind you, in this program, you don't appear on the screen and your microphone is muted. But now that we're broadcasting, the way that you can connect with others through this forum is to type in the chat. Um, the chat function is great for saying hello to everyone um, out there if, you, if you're talking to all panelists and attendees. But it's also a way to alert someone on the Vesterheim staff if you're having some kind of technical challenge or something you'd like to communicate. Martha Griesheimer is a staff member here with me tonight and she's being our uh, wizard behind the curtain. So I wanna thank Martha. Please, when you have a question or a concern about technology, you can select Martha Griesheimer from the chat drop down and talk to her directly and she will talk to you directly privately as well. Um, when we start the presentation with Karen, um, we're going to be showing some images so that you can see some of the amazing hair work that we're talking about tonight. Um, we're not going to answer questions during the presentation, but the second half of the event, we will take topic related converse, uh, questions and the way to um, ask those is through the Q&A. So if you go to move your cursor to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a menu bar. Um, and you'll see there is a Q&A. If you click on that, you can go ahead and type in your question. And uh, Lorraine Gilbertson, my colleague, and I will be fielding those the second half of the program. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce uh, a few people tonight. First, my colleague, Chief Curator Lorraine Gilbertson, whose specialty is textiles. She's going to be sharing the program tonight with our featured speaker. Lorraine would like to thank our sponsors for the evening at this time. Support for this program tonight is provided by the Iowa Arts Council, a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, and the National Endowment for the Arts through the federal CARES legislation, Silos and Smokestacks, National Heritage Area, and the Huebner Education Fund. We have to thank them as well. If you enjoy this evening's program and want to help Westerheim continue to offer programming like this, we hope you'll consider becoming a member. If you're already a Vesterheim member, you might also like to consider making a donation online at vesterheim.org. Especially now during these challenging times, membership and financial gifts to the museum are especially appreciated. So thank you to our sponsors, and I'm really looking forward to this evening with Karen. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Loran. Um, now I'd like to introduce our featured host this evening and speaker, who is Karen Keenan. As a child, Karen was interested in her mother's hair brooch from Vamhus, Sweden. Years later, with many needlework projects under her belt, Karen read about Swedish women entrepreneurs from the 1800s who traveled from their homes in Sweden to major European urban areas to make hair jewelry for others. At the time, Karen was unaware where this growing curiosity and hair work would lead. Then in 2018, supported by the Reviving Folk Arts in the Midwest Fellowship through the American Scandinavian Foundation, Karen traveled to Vamhus, Sweden to apprentice with a master hair worker, Johanna Svensson. In October, 2019, the Nordic Center in Duluth, Minnesota featured an exhibition of hair jewelry, historical artifacts and resources curated by Karen called Woven, Traditional Swedish Hair Jewelry. Following the exhibition, Karen began teaching others how to make table-made hair bracelets at the Nordic Center and at North House Folk School in Grand Marais, Minnesota. Karen continues to be fascinated with hair work, accepts commissions, and is eager to share what she knows with others. When not doing hair work, she can be found playing flute, making and teaching pottery, or digging in the garden. So without further ado, we want to welcome Karen to our program tonight. Thank you, Leah. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here, <clears throat> and I want to also thank Loran uh, for 
welcoming to welcoming welcoming me to this um, format and to um, providing this time to share something that um, I, I knew about and have come to love even deeper, uh, and that is hair work. Um, I appreciated the introduction you gave, Leah. Um, thank you, because what you mentioned were all the, the organizations and the, the people behind all of this work um, that have really helped me over the last two years to uh, be ready to talk to you tonight. I wanna also thank one uh, other person and a couple more. Um, and, and these are people that I haven't talked to you about, but uh, well, in Vamhus, I stayed with my uh, cousin Bertel and his wife, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is, uh, is frequently asked to write historical articles. And often they are historical articles on the, the hair workers from Vamhus. So she has been really very instrumental in my understanding of the hair workers as well. And then the other thing is uh, Vamhus is a very small community of about 850,000, 850, not thousand, 850 people. Um, and the uh, hair worker group from Vamhus welcomed me to their meeting and others in the community welcomed me to a bunch of different places. So I just really um, can't thank the people who have helped me along this road enough. Um, so, uh, I am delighted also to um, welcome all the attendees tonight. I'm really eager to share with you what I've come to know, and I hope you do have some questions as you, um, as you listen to this presentation. I'm certainly eager to learn and share with you. Um, so tonight I'm giving a bit of context, um, and then... Um, uh, that context will kind of end and Lorraine and I will start to have some conversations about some artifacts that are at, um, at uh, Vesterheim and in that we'll be able to share some more information and then we'll have uh, time for Q&A. So let's begin. Um, here we are. Uh, this is um, the first slide, and this is more like an introductory slide, and we're moving on probably to the, oh, wait a minute, I might, I might say something before we leave this slide. You're noticing a uh, brooch on the left. This is the Vamhus brooch. You will see me wearing it tonight, and please note other places where you see it in the pictures. Uh, you'll know more about the other slide later on. Okay. We can go on. Um, this is a, a very quick and curious story. Um, as stated earlier, um, my relatives were hair workers in uh, Sweden, and I was aware of hair work growing up as a young child in Bemidji. Um, my mother was um, a, a very um, instrumental person in helping us learn the culture of our ancestors. Um, and in the 60s, my mother's aunt, Anna, from uh, Vamhus, she's the one who stayed in Vamhus, her three brothers um, immigrated to the United States. Uh, and Aunt Anna came to visit, and she brought this book. It had just been translated from Swedish to English, and you can see here that it was written by Edith Unnerstedt, um, and it's called A Journey to England. And you'll see that in, in the, um, on the, the building there, it says hair fashions. And you see some people um, dressed in folk costumes. Uh, and you also see uh, probably a sophisticated uh, lady from London. Um, Edith Understead uh, collected stories of the hair workers of Sweden, particularly those in Vamhus, and she wrote two books, this one and another one called Travels with Grandmother. Aunt Anna brought this book to our family, and she brought it to the four other families that um, were part of my uh, grandmother and grandfather's um, children and their families. 
Uh, and I didn't find out until I started to work on the application for the uh, American Scandinavian Foundation that in fact, Aunt Anna brought us this book in the 60s in hopes that one of us in the family here in America would learn the art of hair work. Well, as it happens, no one in our family read that book. And it wasn't until my mother's um, house was um, broken up and she moved into um, uh, independent living that um, I saw this book and I said, would you mind if I take this and, I, and I'll read it? And I did, and I was fascinated. So that story comes into play a little bit later. So let's go to the next slide. This is another piece of um, my memory uh, in, from the 1990s. Um, we had a, a family um, book of pictures that um, mom had, and she was kind of the historian for her family. Uh, and I was familiar with this picture. And here you see two women dressed in their finery and in front of them is a hair table with bobbins and they're probably both holding hair work jewelry. And on the table in the lower left, you see it is filled with hair jewelry. Well, that hair table is the tool that is used to weave the braids with hair. And if you look directly behind me, you see a, um, uh, a hair table um, as a prop for tonight's conversation. Well, the woman on the left is my great grandmother. Her name is Karen. And um, if we can turn this, oh, and the other woman's name is Mate. And I'm still trying to figure out whether Mate is a sister. I don't think she's a sister, or she could be a sister to Karen's mother. So we'll see. More to, more to learn. Here you see um, pictures that I discovered not in the 90s, but in that period of time where I was doing the application for the, uh, the uh, American Scandinavian Foundation. And here you see three people on the picture on the left. And the one that is standing is great grandmother Karen. Mate is on the left. And Karen's mother, Tisk Margit Erstadter, is seated on the right. But the curious thing is, with this picture, if you look down at the bottom, you'll see that the um, printing is in Cyrillic. And that means that this picture was taken in St. Petersburg. So this is an artifact showing that the three of them were hair workers in St. Petersburg. And then the daguerreotype that is to your right is a picture of Tisk Margit, probably in the early 1800s. And she was a hair worker at that time. So hair work became popular somewhere around the early 1800s. So Tisk Margit was one of the early hair workers. So, and here you see Joanna Svensson, and she is the um, woman that taught me how to do hair jewelry. Truthfully, when it came time to write this um, application, I didn't know who to turn to to ask who could teach me um, hair jewelry. And um, so I just blindly sent a message to um, the woman that has a Hemschloid, which is a, a store of um, handcrafted goods um, in Vomhus, and it's called Myron's Hemschloid, and Myron is Joanna's husband. I had been to that Hemschloid before, so I knew that um, there was some connection there. And so I, and she was the only email that I had, um, and so I sent her a blind email introducing myself, 
um, much like I just introduced relatives and, and I told her that I was from Vamhus or my relatives were from Vamhus and that I was wondering if she knew of anybody who could teach me how to do hair work. And she wrote back to me very quickly and she said, well, I suppose I could. And so that began a, a excellent relationship. Joanna and I have kept in touch uh, ever since I went there and I spent two weeks with her from 10 in the morning till six at night learning hair work. And she is a delightful teacher. We found that we had much in common. She's also a musician and she grew up in Chicago. So she could speak English, which was a gift for me. Um, although my uh, cousin's wife, Elizabeth, is a very good English speaker as well. Notice too, that Joanna is wearing a Vamhus brooch. Okay. Oh, by the way, chance favors a prepared mind. Um, I might take a moment and explain to you why I put that. You'll, you'll be noticing that there are little tidbits of learning hair work as I grew up. And it wasn't until later when this opportunity from the American Scandinavian Foundation came up that um, I started to put all this together into um, something that turned into a wonderful project. So that aside, here is some of Joanna Peterson or Joanna Svensson's work. Um, on the back, you see uh, an example of one type of hair work, which is called gimping. And that is um, a, a, a tradition in, way, in which hair is woven around wire and then the wire is fashioned into whatever shape you'd like it to be, oftentimes floral. These are home adornments and under those are some uh, examples of beautiful hair work that Joanna did. Uh, and you'll notice that um, one of the hallmarks of hair work made in Vamhus is the use of wooden beads covered with hair to use as findings. Um, and that is a characteristic that really connotes that um, the influence of Vamhus style uh, hair work. Okay. And here you see, and this is not necessarily a, a conversation tonight about how hair work is made, but this slide gives a, a, a nod to the, to the way hair is woven using a hair table. Okay. And here you see um, some of the work that I have done since I came back um, from uh, working with Joanna in, um, that was in November of 2018. So last year, um, I have to be honest, when COVID struck and we were um, landlocked in our homes, I was very delighted to just sit and work. So um, here you see that um, a, a mix of um, traditional um, Vamo style uh, hair, jewelry in relation to some that I am uh, using some influences of past beadwork and um, being inspired by things that are from the North Shore um, in the area of Duluth. Um, I have to say that when um, I was with Johanna, she asked me a question that really piqued my curiosity. She said, Karen, I know you're a potter and I know you're now learning hair jewelry. How are you gonna do both of them? And that really stuck in my head. Well, this is how I'm doing both of them. I am making ceramic um, jewelry boxes and putting the hair items in these containers. Uh, here you see an example of uh, something I made for a young man uh, who had very long hair. Uh, and he's a colleague of mine in the pottery realm around here. And one day I saw him and he had short hair. And I said, what did you do with your hair? And he looked at me kind of strangely. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, if, if 
you know, if you're not doing anything with it, here's what I do and check out this website and you'll try to, you'll, you can see what I do. Uh, well, a week, week later, to make a long story short, Brett, his name is, uh, brought me a bag and in that bag was his hair. And I asked him, what can I do for you? And he said, you could make me a bracelet. So this is a manly bracelet for Brett. Um, I have, I'm doing other things as well. Um, and these are more musings along the line of, uh, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a jewelry box that I'm making, but perhaps what would a vase look like if there were um, hair braids around it? And then further, what if this were a, a vase made with a loved one's hair? And thinking even further, maybe that person has a particularly fun fondness for uh, a particular flower um, and you could keep it in there and think of that person but um, I'm getting very sentimental but hair work does come out of a very sentimental need um, and that was very true in the Victorian era. Um, there's one other question that um, surfaced while I was in Vamhus and this one was um, I, I think this happened um, either during the time that I met the rest of the hair workers or perhaps it was Joanna. But the important thing is, is that I remember the question. Uh, and that was, uh, the hair workers were musing on the fact that, um, or thinking about the fact that many hair workers left from Vamhus to move to the United States. And in some cases, they were familiar with where they went, but they wondered, did the hair workers who knew how to make hair jewelry, did they continue to do that in the United States? And I'm, you know, that, that's an intriguing question. And I'm very curious about that because I can't find very much written about that. Uh, Joanna has sent me some names to explore and um, I just want to put it out there to the community that um, it, it seems as though it would be nice to pay honor to um, these individuals by writing up um, something about them so that we can um, have that as some sort of archive. So that's where I am now. And um, I think that uh, if I were going to put a little closure to that context, I would say that um, along the journey of learning how to do hair work has taught me a couple of things. One is be awake. You never know how life's dots are going to be connected. And then secondly, um, rethink. History as we perceive it is not necessarily real. And the reason I say this is because I had always assumed that Victorian ladies were very much ladies and they didn't do much other than um, stay at home, keep the home fires going, all those kinds of things. That was not at all true with the hair workers. They were entrepreneurs. They worked really hard on the farm in the summertime and in the wintertime, they gathered all their tools, they gathered the baskets the men had made from, from um, the various farms, and they went to the big cities and they sold those. And they worked on commissions and they stayed there maybe up to six months. Then they went back and they worked on the farm. So these were very strong women and that was pretty amazing. And then the third thing is, be, be curious, pay attention to the questions that capture your curiosity. We always move in the direction of the questions we ask. So with that summary, um, Lauren, let's take some look at uh, Vesterheim's collection. Great, well, it's fun to find out a little bit more about our pieces. And so what we know about this brooch is that it was made by Nina Spar in Vamhus, Sweden in 2015. Okay, so uh, a little bit about um, families in Vamhus. Uh, you already know it's, it's a little um, village. Um, it's in the province of Dalarna and it's um, to the west and a little bit north of Stockholm. 
Um, it's by Lake Orsha. And many families interact with each other. SPAR is a very common name or very familiar name. Um, I am familiar not with Nina, but with Anna. And Anna is a, a textile curator, I think, in Friedrichshaven in Copenhagen area. Um, and she is a very fine hair worker. Um, I've seen many of her pieces and she does a wonderful job. Um, we already talked about Joanna's um, hair brooch. And um, this is my mother's name, Carol May Heed Sather. And she was gifted with this brooch, I'm guessing, probably at the same time that uh, a traditional Swedish direct from Sweden was sent to her. Um, and I suspect that was probably around the time of her confirmation. I'm not sure. But if you see this brooch, you can rest assured that it probably came from Valmos. The next two pieces belong to Esther and Arvid Nilsson, who came from Norway in the 1940s to live in Los Angeles, California. Okay, so here you see evidence of a Norwegian wearing Swedish jewelry. <laughs> um, and the reason I say it's Swedish is because of the characteristic covered wooden bead. Um, and this particular um, pattern is very complicated. These are not easy to make. And you can see that a loose weave sometimes can get some errant hairs that kind of fall out of the uh, clutches of the, the weave. Um, but this um, particular um, necklace is a beautiful example showing how um, a bracelet or a necklace is made in this particular case from three separate berets. Um, and they're connected by the wooden findings. And I might also say here that um, uh, the wooden findings are, uh, are a way of using the resources that are at hand. Vamhus is a forested area. Um, and uh, back in the day, uh, it was a, uh, a very humble village. Um, but it also demonstrates that no, no matter how much money you have, you always want to create beauty around you. And so you look at the resources that you have at hand and you make beauty from them. So that's um, kind of uh, how those, um, the Swedish design happened in this case. Um, I might want to also say at this point is that Vamhus is the village that has kept hair work, Swedish style, going for the last 200 years. Uh, in the Victorian era, it was very, very common to, to run around with all sorts of really long hair. And so the hair resource was quite abundant. In the uh, early 1900s, long hair was not so much the fashion and women started to get it cut. And ultimately hair work grew out of uh, popularity and um, it's almost a dying folk art. So it's great that Vamhus is kept it alive. They have a uh, open air museum there with many, many fine examples of hair work. Go ahead. And this is the second one, which is, comes from the same family. You see that this is a, uh, a chain with a straight braid. It's a long chain. Perhaps it was used for um, uh, a lady's watch that she would be um, carrying around her neck. Uh, notice it does have the covered beads. And you'll see that there are areas where the hair is running free. Um, Either it's an unfinished piece or perhaps the, um, the connector, the finding uh, became dislodged and it, it came apart. But it, it, at any rate, it's a very fine example of uh, hair work. 
This watch chain with the agate fob belonged to Martinius Osterheim. His mother Sigrid gave him some of her hair when he left Norway in 1872 for Todd County, Minnesota. He had her hair made into a watch chain in Minnesota in the 1880s. Okay, so if I remember correctly, Loren, did he have it made by somebody in Minneapolis? I don't know if we know, we know Minnesota. Okay, we know Minnesota. Okay, so there, there. Uh, according to what Johanna has told me, there is a woman um, who was in Minneapolis, and her name was Mona Erickson, and she was a very fine hair worker. Um, so that is uh, another piece of the puzzle that would be um, good to find more information about. Perhaps she made this. Um, this is an example of a man's watch chain. And if you think of the 1800s um, and you think of uh, men wearing, it was very, very common for men to wear uh, three-piece suits and they had vests. And in those vests, you would carry your watch and you would need some sort of watch chain. Um, so somebody once explained it to me that the um, watch chain of the 1800s is the iPhone of today. <laughs> we can't, can't go anywhere without our iPhone. Um, this particular um, uh, example shows that uh, the metal findings were often uh, used with hair work. And if you go to um, uh, any of the, um, oh, what do I want to say, the antique stores or even um, markets, you can often find examples of uh, hair jewelry that, that do contain the metal findings. Um, there were catalogs that they could be ordered from and oftentimes uh, hair workers would work alongside jewelers. Uh, so the other thing that I wanted to mention about this is um, the value placed on hair was um, a curious thing. Uh, this is an example of a mother cutting her hair so her son would remember her. I can only imagine the pain of saying goodbye to your child and not knowing whether or not you will see them again. Uh, what a loving act for the son to um, have this watch chain made of his mother's hair. It's a, an everyday connection to his mother. Um, and this is perhaps why we often keep our, um, our baby's hair or perhaps our mother's kept our hair. It's a lingering, art of, lingering practice of something that uh, was historically done. At least that's what I think. <laughs> so here's an example uh, of where uh, hair workers would work alongside um, not only jewelers, but they would work alongside hairdressers. And he, this is an example from uh, a Chicago ad that was um, in a newspaper, or it may have been uh, a magazine. I found this on, um, oh, the Internet Archive, which is a great resource. Uh, and here you see that uh, from this place, you can get swatches and braids and curls and puffs and all sorts of things, including hair jewelry made to order. Um, and if you look at the um, image of the uh, woman pictured here, you can see that she has abundant hair. And you wonder, is all of that hers? Maybe not. Um, and she may have hair jewelry earrings. Uh, and she may even have um, an edging on her clothes that was made with a hair braid. Who knows? Uh, but it's an example of something very typical during um, the 1800s in America. Hair work was very popular, um, particularly popular um, during the Civil War time when a lot of people were lost to that war. So there you go, uh, connected to all sorts of things. Next one. This is a photo of the Wickney family and Anders Wickney 
had a watch chain made out of hair from one of his family members. And so one of the people in the picture contributed hair for his watch chain. And it was son Henry Whitney. So the watch chain was made shortly after Henry's first haircut in 1894. Thank you, Loren. Um, now Henry still has long hair. Um, so Henry's hair was probably pretty long when he got it cut. Um, when I first saw this picture, the first thing I did was to find where is it Northwood? Yeah, Northwood, North Dakota. Northwood, North Dakota, I had to find out where that was. And um, what I found out was, is you could travel by train to either Fargo or Grand Forks from Northwood. So um, it's not far-fetched to think that perhaps there was a hair worker who lived in those larger communities um, that could do this kind of work. Or perhaps Henry's mom knew how to do hair work and she ordered the findings and made it on her own. We don't know. But this is a lovely example of expert artistry. Um, you can see that in this particular case, the um, braid on either side contains a, a few patterns. Uh, and the uh, twist pattern is very common. And the second pattern is one that I find very intriguing. I don't think I've seen this one before, um, but it has a chain-like feeling to it, um, and it goes all around the circumference of the braid. So I'm, I looked in a resource to see if I could find this pattern, and I couldn't. So um, I'm going to have to do some investigating there. Um, I, I, I might say during this particular slide that um, one of the things that inspired people to make hair work so popular is that um, a tutorial was written in the 1800s by the uh, name of a, uh, a gentleman whose last name was Campbell. And Mark, I think was his first name. He took the knowledge that was um, known about hair work and he wrote a tutorial that included um, many, many patterns and many, many examples of work and examples of findings. Uh, and that, of course, you, when you transfer knowledge, you transfer the ability of um, all sorts of people to do this work. So up until then, the knowledge about hair work was um, rather proprietary because it was the livelihood of um, the, the hair workers that practiced that trade. Um, and if I might say uh, additional information about that, people often ask, well, where, where did hair work originate? Well, it's, it doesn't take too much of a leap to say that hair work may be very similar to bobbin lace. Um, and also, it is very similar in knowledge base to the act of making wigs. But if you go further back, you find in history that um, people practiced it in, uh, you, can, you can turn it, that's fine. Um, people practiced it early in Sweden and it can be traced back to the um, 1700s. Uh, two young girls from Vamhus and Bonus, a neighboring village, who would make rings out of birch bark and horsehair. And they would sell those um, at various places, including Norway. So um, it was something that was uh, carried over from a variety of different art forms. Here you see picture, oh, Lauren, you want to say something about this before I say anything more? Oh, sure. This is a, just a small two-sided card. On one side is punched paper with the name Marin Haugen embroidered with wool yarn. And on the other side is this hair work embellishment. Yes. And um, I just want to say quickly that um, hair work was very popular amongst um, the younger crowd in the 1800s as well. Um, and uh, it was a common thing for friends to share cards with their 
hair, um, either tied together in a, a flourish or a practice pattern was something that um, individuals with, would share with each other. It was a sign of friendship. Um, again, hair work was just as popular as embroidery or knitting. Um, so it was just a common thing that was done. Uh, there are four types of hair work, and I might recently say um, that um, there was an exhibition about two years ago at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia on the um, curious art of hair work. And uh, if you're curious about learning more about that exhibition, check out Mutter Museum. They have an excellent book uh, on the subject. There are four types of um, ways to work with hair. One is the gimp, and that you saw an example of uh, the piece that Joanna Svensson did as an adornment for the walls of the home. There is palette work, which is lining up the hair um, and, and, you know, side to side, side to side, and then putting this um, uh, medium over it, letting it dry, and then cutting it into a variety of shapes, and you can make images from that. Um, often the, um, the little cutouts are put on opaque glass. Uh, another one is dissolved hair work. Uh, and again, on, the, on a base of um, opaque glass, the uh, hair work or the hair is cut into little teeny bits and then it's put in a painting medium. So it's in a liquid form and then you can paint it on uh, um, a foundation. Uh, there are many examples of these two as well. And then finally, what you're seeing tonight is the hair jewelry. This is just a very small brooch. It's only about the size of a nickel. And uh, the donor said that this was a memorial to Caroline Flodiger, who had died in 1932 in southeastern Minnesota. Okay. And here you see evidence that hair work was alive and well in 1932. So um, they were still practicing it uh, as an art in Minnesota. So um, wait a minute. What was that last one? Okay, I suspect that this is an example of palette work. Um, the, the thing that would, um, it, it may be a unique form of palette work. The only reason I say that is because there seems to be some texture in the weaving of the hair that would be interesting to look at. Okay. This is just a detail of a watch chain that belonged to the Anderson family in Swift County, Minnesota. Okay. This is a beautiful piece. Again, it's expertly made and it's very uniform. Um, I was able to find both of these patterns in Campbell's book. And of course, this whole um, interaction with Westerheim is inspiring me tremendously <laughs> to try all these patterns. So I wanna thank you for this inspiration. Um, I, I might wanna say at this point that um, Hair work comes out of the folk art um, realm. And there was a significant amount of attention um, uh, when industrialization happened at the intersection of um, folk art. And, and there were many people who did not want to lose the folk art traditions. And, but yet, the industrialized people want, I mean, we're just enamored with machines. Um, there was the advent of lace making machines and I'm no expert on this, but I believe I heard someone say that there were also hair work making machines. Um, again, another place for me to do some more research. Um, but I, I have heard people when they do look at some hair work, they will say, this is way too uniform. It must be made by a machine. So I don't think this is the case in this particular instance, but I wanted to share that with, with you uh, nonetheless. Okay. And this is a lady's watch chain that belonged to Elvira Auger in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. 
when it was donated, the donor said that this was made out of human hair. Right. And if you remember my conversation or my, my comment earlier about the young girls who made uh, rings of um, birch bark or horse hair, when I first saw these pictures, I thought, oh, wait a minute. I, I can't imagine making hair work braids like this. This looks like rings interacting with one another, which made me think, oh, this might be, you know, that tradition of making bark or root rings and extending it into the notion of a chain for um, carrying a watch. It's not unreasonable. Okay, this is my part, right, Lorraine? Yes. Okay, so um, I, I just wanted to pause here um, and say that uh, hair work continues to evolve like any art form as we as humanity are um, marching a long time and gaining different insights and new wisdom. It is, it is very um, appropriate for us to look at folk arts through new eyes. And here you see two examples. Um, one, of the, one of the best resources for learning what people are doing out there in the world of hair work is to check out Instagram, Facebook. And here you see uh, two examples of um, uh, hair work that's being done. Uh, the one on the left is um, done by Jacob Schies, and he lives in Appenzell, Switzerland. He is a remarkable hair worker. Uh, and here you see his work uh, in a very contemporary fashion. The findings are very contemporary. And his uh, hair work is the open lace um, pattern. So beautiful work, and I, I suggest you check him out. He's just a fantastic um, artisan. Uh, another one to the right is an example of an American uh, who has asked the question, what can you do with hair to create art? Um, and here, while it looks like this brooch is um, something, maybe a, a pencil line drawing. In fact, what you see as a black line here is hair. Uh, so this is a very fine interpretation of looking at the use of hair, which of course is a renewable resource. Um, I wanna put a shout out here for um, the Victorian Hair Workers International. They are a wonderful resource um, who, um, under the, the um, guidance of uh, Bridget Grams, uh, they are connecting hair workers across the world. Uh, and I just read something uh, in one of their posts recently that they are aware of only 100 hair workers in the United States. So, uh, excuse me, not in the United States, in the world. So I find that pretty phenomenal. So there you go. We are to the point where we're hoping that you have questions. Oh, wait a minute. I yeah, actually, you know, and we, since we do have a few questions, I might just go quickly through the resources so people sure. get a chance to see them. And then we can always type the titles into the chat later too. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so um, for those of you um, who um, want to look at um, hair work further, I, these are the books that I suggest. Uh, you've heard me talk about Mark Campbell's book. Uh, I haven't mentioned Jeannie Bell, but if you have hair work items and want to look at comparable items, this is a remarkable resource. And Love Entwined, uh, Helen Schumacher, this is a recent book um, within the last five years. Um, Curious History of Hair Work in America. A lot of this has to do with the Civil War era. 
but um, she has captured a remarkable resource in this book. And then here you see the Mutter Museum um, book as well. Can I go back to that first slide of the resources, Leah? Yeah. Okay, I didn't get a chance to say, uh, Joy Lintelman um, is a professor at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, and she wrote this book, I Go to America. Um, and Loran was uh, gracious enough to point me to um, Joy, and I read this book uh, prior to uh, reaching out to Joy uh, about, did she know of any hair workers in the Midwest? And um, uh, well, Joy didn't know of any hair workers. After I finished reading this book, which is a story of uh, Mina Anderson, and those of you who are familiar with the immigrants, uh, Moberg's book, um, Moberg used Mina's uh, uh, journal as a resource for his writing. Um, a Swedish immigrant woman, if she knew hair work, and if she were uh, an immigrant person settling a farm uh, in the Midwest that I came to the conclusion it may or may not be right. Uh, she probably had very little time to do hair work. <laughs> so that's probably not true of all immigrants. Obviously, we know of some who have done it, but this is a very, very good read. So there you go. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, when we talked, I don't know, a month ago or six weeks ago about this, we were so excited that you were willing to share. And um, it's just been such a rich experience getting to hear, you know, your journey in the in doing hair work and your research, and then also being able to connect to pieces that um, Loran helped, you know, and our own museum, it's just been great. We're all so obsessed right now with our hair and if it's growing and if it's been cut or not. And um, so it's just timely, I think. So we're gonna field a few questions here. We have a few minutes left. Um, and so I am going to ask a question from Christine. How do you treat the hair to make it stay together while you work with it? Oh, well, I work with it. You know, I don't treat it at all. Um, uh, when you um, work with the hair, you wanna make sure that the, the lengths are uniform. And if you're familiar with bobbin lace work, you know that you on one side you tie the bobbin and on the other side, it's in the middle of the hair table. So there's tension there and that tension holds everything together. Great. I have a, a story to share from one of our viewers tonight, Renee, her husband's grandmother was a hair worker. That was Anna Bergstrom, and she was a Swedish immigrant who settled uh, with her husband Swan on their homestead near Rocheville, South Dakota. They supplemented their farm income with her hair work and his watch repair. Swan died in an accident, leaving Anna with their six children and pregnant with her seventh. She successfully farmed with her sons and continued the hair work. So one of what I hope will be many stories that you start to hear from other Swedish women in America continuing hair work. Wonderful. That's absolutely fantastic. I really do want to explore this. And this, this is an example of exactly what the women did in Sweden, farming and hair work. Thank you. Um, and we have another, we have actually a couple of questions about dyeing. Like one is, do, is hair ever dyed before making jewelry? And the other question is, does hair keep its original color after being cut over time? Oh, these are, these are questions that people have asked me before. Um, hair, <clears throat> hair does not change its color, not that I know of. And if you think about it, um, think about the pictures of the mummies that people have found over time. What remains on the mummy is the hair and often it's dark, the color that it was probably when the person was alive. What was the other question? If anyone ever dyed the hair after it was cut to make the jewelry. Yes. Um, well, let me put it this way. Um, hair these days um, is a precious commodity 
long hair. If you're going to make hair jewelry, uh, you have to have at least 12 inches of hair. Um, and more is better because obviously the longer the hair, the longer the braid, right? Um, and uh, so when um, hair is sold today, like say for instance, if you were to go out and look for uh, a wig, um, chances are the wig maker uh, dyed the hair before the wig was made to the specifications that people want, right? Um, but, uh, and I have used some of that dyed hair, but dyeing it beforehand to do the jewelry, I have not heard of. Great, thank you. Cynthia has a question. Uh, she had seen hair wreaths before where the hair is made into flower shapes and she wondered how that was similar to hair jewelry. Okay. Um, well, they both use tools, of course. And in gimping, um, you do not use the hair table, but you do use a, um, a knitting needle. And you um, use the knitting needle to hold the wire as you wrap the hair around the wire and the knitting needle. Um, there's one woman out east, her name is Karen Bachman. She um, lives in New York. And when the Mutter Museum had their exhibit, Karen taught gimping. My daughter and I went to that class. It was really fun. Um, so gimping has, like hair jewelry, many different kinds of patterns. So once you um, use the uh, knitting needle to wrap around the wire, and in a certain type of pattern, then you take the knitting needle out and what remains is the hair and the wire. And then you arrange those in however you'd like. Awesome. Um, someone asked if there would ever be a class on this. And I think this is important for you to share what you talked to us about before, uh, some of your secrets you learned, right? Oh, yes, okay. Um, so yes, I, I do teach hair jewelry. Um, and Leah uh, reminds me of how I have been cautioned to only teach a little bit. Um, and that is to honor the hair workers of Vamhus who have kept this Swedish tradition alive. Uh, and it is their knowledge that they use to bring in an income. So when I teach hair jewelry, if you re can remember back to that slide, I will teach a braid that is um, common. You could perhaps find it in Mark Campbell's book. And, and the, <clears throat> the findings that we use are um, findings that would be typical, typically found around here. So I won't teach you how to do the, the um, wooden bead. But we'll see, We're, Vesterheim wants to keep talking and we'll see if we can get Karen to teach at Vesterheim someday. Thanks for that plug. I don't even know who asked it. I didn't plant that question. Oh, okay, good. Um, I think we have time for one more question, Loran. Oh, there's so many good questions. Um, Sally recognized the similarity between the hair table work and Kumihimo. Yes. Thank you, Sally, for bringing that up. As a matter of fact, this became a major distraction for me when I got back home. And I started to purchase all sorts of Komi Himmel books and, and messed around with that. Um, yes, the Japanese art of silk braiding using Kumi Himmel patterns is very, very similar to the hair table. What's different is that <clears throat> The kumihimo table is stationary, and the um, this table, this comes off, and you can turn it around on its base, which makes it, um, it gives a little different dimension to the weaving process. So one can, one can look at either of these art forms and be informed in new ways. Awesome. Well, 
I hate to bring this to a close, but it's 830. So, um, but there were so many great questions and um, we are recording this session tonight and have plans to release it um, up on social media and Facebook next week. So that if you have friends that you want to encourage to um, take a listen to this and watch um, Karen's presentation, you can do, you can capture it there next week. Um, I also want to remind everyone that um, we're constantly putting up new programs uh, on our online folk art online section of the Vesterheim.org website. Um, everything from you know book groups of Scandinavian authors to mini folk art classes to um, free events like this that happen monthly. So our next one is on September 22nd and it is a folk art conversation with Robbie Lafleur, who is a Vesterheim gold medalist weaver. She's doing a presentation that's called From Kindness to Cutting Satire, Lila Nelson's Tapestries Embrace the World and Its Politics. So she will be talking about um, some of Lila Nelson's beautiful and also very, uh, very social, socially adjusted centered uh, tapestries. And we're excited about that. That'll be 730 again. It is free um, and you can register through our website for the Zoom event. We are going to send an evaluation to your email later this evening. We are learning alongside you. So we appreciate any feedback you can give us um, so that we can keep doing a better job. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much to our wonderful uh, presenters tonight, uh, my colleague, Chief Curator Lorraine Gilbertson, thanks for being here, and Karen Keenan, we are so pleased to have you here, and we hope we see you at Vesterheim in safer times ahead. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care and have a good night.